He taught them to pray the Lord's Prayer. Do we know the Lord's Prayer? We know the Lord's Prayer. And, and we'll say it today. After the prayers that we say for everyone, we always follow that prayer with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Jesus taught us his disciples how to pray and then he prayed for them. Jesus prayed for his disciples as he prays for us. Jesus prayed that God would protect them from the evil one. Jesus prayed for them to all be one, to live as one as him and God does. And Jesus also taught them to pray. He prayed to God that the Holy Spirit would would come to them so that they would all know his word and that they could teach everyone. But Jesus did not just teach the disciples to pray. He taught us to pray as well. The pray that, prayer that he prayed for his disciples, he prays for us probably every day. Let's pray together. Dear God, teach us, Father, to be as one, to live in community with each other. Protect us, Father, from the evil one, and send us the Holy Spirit. So that we may know your word to share with everyone that we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. So tonight, tonight you say your prayers at night? When do you say your prayers? Before you go to bed? When else do we pray? before we eat. And when else should we pray? Whenever we get a chance. So pray. Pray for everyone that you know and pray for yourselves tonight. And have a blessed week.
gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to John, the 17th chapter beginning with the 6th verse. Now you open your Bibles and you dig around and you find that verse, right? Okay. That's why I say that. John chapter 17, verse 6. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them in your name, that, that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in the truth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Three times in this passage, Jesus prays for his disciples and for us. He says, so that they may be. In verse 11, he says, protect them in your name, so they may be one. In verse 13, he prays, I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. And in verse 19, I sanctify myself so they also may be sanctified. And for the last few weeks, we have been in the upper room with Jesus and his disciples as they ate together the Last Supper. And we just talked about the sacramentality of eating together as the body of Christ. And this is where that all began. Soon they will leave that place. They will walk across the Kidron Valley out of Jerusalem to a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And then this is where Jesus will be arrested. Now Jesus has been making a rather lengthy speech. It started way up in John chapter 14. And he's talked, he's talked about himself and about God the Father, and about God the Holy Spirit, and he's talked about the disciples and, and our own relationship with each other and with this Holy Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he culminates all of this with a prayer. Now we are well familiar with the prayers of Jesus. Jesus just talked to the children about that. We pray as he taught us the Lord's Prayer. 
we pray that all the time. Okay? When I introduce that prayer, I say, let us pray without ceasing. That is a prayer that we pray without ceasing. And this was Jesus' template for prayer. He said, pray in this way. He said in Matthew chapter 6, pray in this way. And this is the way that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. Okay, we can find the parallels there. Many of the elements of the Lord's Prayer in this prayer in John 17. He prays, he speaks of the glory of God. Okay, of God giving eternal life. Of, of God's presence in action in the world. And his protection from, of us from the evil one. But here in this prayer, Jesus talks in rather lofty terms about his disciples. Okay, they have been given God's word and they know from where it came or where it comes and they, and they believe all of the right things about the person of Jesus Christ. You know, they know who he is. You know, but this is probably giving them a bit more credit than they deserve. They, they were lying around the table. That's how they ate. They, they laid at the table on that Thursday night in Jerusalem. And Judas at this time has already left the group and he's gone out to lead the soldiers who will arrest Jesus. And Jesus tells his disciples that to a man they will desert him and lead him to be tortured and to die alone on the cross. Peter himself three times will vehemently deny that he even knows Jesus. These are not people who have it all together on the key truths about the person and work of Jesus Christ. But the point here is that we need to keep in mind that Jesus is praying to God in their presence. Okay, they were meant to hear Jesus' prayer as part of this overall speech that Jesus, as Jesus was preparing the disciples for the events that were unfolding, even as he spoke. This is what Jesus wanted to be true about his disciples. This is what needed to be true. And this is what would eventually be true on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit indwelt each one of them. And that's what we will talk about next week on the day of Pentecost. Now, Jesus is about to leave the world. In less than 24 hours, he will be dead. Jesus prays that his disciples would be protected in the name, okay, the very nature, the very essence of the triune God. You know, the NRSV translates this word protected um, but it is closer to the word to keep. Okay, the name of God is not going to protect the disciples in any kind of physical sense. Okay, it will not make them safe. They in fact are go into great danger. They willingly go into great danger as do many people in the early church. And they suffer and they die because of the name of God. Jesus here is asking that God the Father keep them in God's name, that they abide in this name, that they continue to trust and obey in this name so that they may be one. <clears throat> they may be one. That they may continue amidst all of the trials and the tribulations and the suffering and the persecution that's coming, that they may continue to be this community of faith because this is the only way that the mission of God will take place 
for them and for us. It's the only way God's mission will be accomplished in this world if they and as we are one. They and we are to be one as God the Father God the Son, who is Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit are one in this circle dance of perfect Trinitarian love. So John picks up this idea again in verses 20 and 21, that they may all be one. But here we find out that Jesus is not only praying for his disciples, but he's praying also for us. He says, I ask not only on behalf of these, the disciples, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their word. Okay, those who believe through their word is the, the, the community that John was, was speaking to, the community that was at that moment in persecution and needed to hear this word. But he's also speaking to us. Okay, we believe in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. But the one in whom we believe is the Christ who is revealed by the words of those first disciples and all of them, all those who followed them. We pray with Christ that we may be kept in one community of faith because that is the only way that we can do the work that God has for us to do. Jesus is preparing to leave this world and go to the Father and he prays for his disciples so that they, they may be complete in his joy whole speech Jesus has made is so that they and us may have the perfect joy of Jesus Christ. Okay, these, were, these guys were about to see their leader, you know, their, their teacher, their friend, arrested, and tortured, and brutally killed. And they would run, run away and hide in fear that they would be next. Jesus did not want fear and anger to be the dominant emotion in them at that time. Rather, he wanted the opposite. He wanted them to be full of joy. The joy that comes from their relationship with him and his relationship with the Father through the Holy Spirit. You would think, though, yeah, that their joy would be a whole lot more complete if they went with Jesus. Okay, Paul talks about this quite a bit in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapters 14 and 15 and in other places. He talks about the trials and the tribulations of life here and now and the joy that awaits us in the life to come. And he says, yes, we are afflicted now, but we are not crushed. And we are perplexed now, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted now, but we are not forsaken. We are struck down now, but we are not destroyed. And we would rather be away from all this life and be at home in joy with the Lord, but that is not our call. So whether we live or whether we die, we are to have perfect joy. We are to have the perfect joy of Christ in the one community constituted in the name of the triune God. Just as Jesus was sent into the world, so we have been sent into the world to do what God has called us to do. Jesus sanctified himself so that we also may be sanctified. All that Jesus is and does, his incarnation, his life and his ministry, his death and his resurrection and his, his ascension 
to the Father is also that we may be sanctified, that we may grow and mature in the ongoing life of Jesus Christ, that we may participate in the perfect faith and loving kindness of Jesus Christ, even as we learn how to be faithful and loving ourselves. We, you and me, we worship and work in a world and in a country that is becoming ever more hostile to the Christian mission. But this is the world to which we were sent. While we don't have the threats of arrest and death yet, as did the first disciples, and as do many people today in, in much more hostile places around the world, our challenges are actually more insidious. It's political correctness. You know, since the world hates the gospel message, <coughs> we should be prevented from offending the world in any kind of public way. And worse, it's complacency. You know, things are pretty good for most of us. You know, the jagged edges of life in this time and place, you know, they've sort of been smoothed over for us. So why, why should we bother? The truth is, we need all the prayer that we can get as Christ's servants in this world. The good news is that Jesus is still praying right now. Jesus is praying for our protection from the evil one. Thanks be to God for that. And Jesus saw a link between this idea of being in one community and the success of his ministry. This is all about our relationship with God and has nothing to do with human institutions or denominations and church politics. You know, we are not asked to be one with the church, but that all of us together are to be one with God. God has sanctified the church. God has set it apart from the world, and that is his gift. But we are still just a community of flawed and sinful people with no more virtue, virtue or moral perfection than any other group. But this is where we find support and encouragement. This community. This is where we gather together to hear God's word and to remind each other of God's promises. We are drawn together into deeper fellowship and we eat together sacramentally. And through the Holy Spirit, we find the courage and the strength to face the challenges that come from living in this world. We are one, together, in joy, being sanctified in Christ, so that we can bear witness to His gospel of grace and love. And all God's people say, Amen. Let us 